Namaste, everyone. Namaste. Namaste. Well, we had discussed earlier with Richard uh, what we were going to talk about. <laughs> and he had a great suggestion to talk about the difference between the Vedic and the Buddha's language, uh, which is a great suggestion. But uh, I'm so inspired about this, who am I, <laughs> Atma Vichara, that uh, I have to talk about that. Good. I would never I hope complain. You don't... Of, I would never complain about you talking about Atma Vichara. <laughs> okay. So, um, in the last few days, because of studying the Vichara Sangraham, I have got a much deeper understanding of Atma Vichara. And as I detail in the video that's going to be released uh, early tomorrow morning, it's actually a three-part process. And the first part is getting rid of the idea, I am the body. And if we look into this concept, we see that almost the whole contents of the mind is simply related to that. I will go here. I will come from there. I will do this. I will say this to so-and-so. Uh, you know, I, I, I. And, and in every case, I refers to the body. So the first step that Ramana talks about is to get rid of this idea by seeing that the body cannot be I because it's not permanent. And it's conditioned, composed of various elements and other parts. It's not a whole, in other words. So it can't be the self. And then he goes on to the second step, which is getting rid of the idea of I as a separate individual. This is called ahankar, among other names in the scriptures. And uh, another name for it is maya, <laughs> which means that which is not. So the ego, the self, with a small s, is actually a fiction that we create and we jump from one version of it to another based on the constant influx of sense impressions. According to the Buddha's teaching, there are six senses, hearing, sight, taste, smell, touch, and the mind. So what happens is we start a little vortex, a whirlpool of name and form around these different perceptions. And this is called the vritti. Vritti means uh, mental modifications, or I mean, literally, it means whirlpool. So we spin up these vortexes of name and form and then base our consciousness on them uh, because they simulate the appearance of a place, a location, a thing, a separate object. So uh, this is called Chitta Vritti in the Yoga Sutras. And the aim of yoga, according to Patanjali, is chitta vritti nirodaha. In other words, to get rid of these vortexes, these little whirlpools of mental activity. Because they cover the real mind or the real self 
the pure consciousness, the unconditioned non-dual consciousness, which is always the same. So that's the second stage. Once that stage is accomplished, the self with a capital S shines forth by itself. At this stage, there's no more effort. All the effort is involved in the first two stages. So this is why the third stage is called abiding. Abiding in the self, in the heart. It's a effortless. And, and we see this or experience it as grace. It's not something we do. It's something that happens to us. And uh, we can't do it because at this stage, there's no doer. So there's nobody to do anything. Uh, so we just relax and we find ourselves in a space, which is the self, which is luminous, self-aware, unconditioned, boundaryless, which means infinite, and complete. There is nothing missing. Everything is there. It's perfect and beautiful and full and uh, all good qualities. Uh, so this is self-realization. And actually, Ramana says the self always exists. So it's not that we have to create or reach or go to or become the self. Self is already there, fully functional, ready to go. All we have to do is take away these other things that cover it, that we distract ourselves with. If you've ever seen a monkey, a monkey will grab a branch and swing like Tarzan on this branch and then when it gets within reach of the next branch, it grabs that one with the other hand or foot, <laughs> whatever's handy, or footsie or something. And uh, in this way, the monkey propels itself through the trees astonishingly fast. And the mind is like this, too. The mind will grab onto one of these vortexes and hang on to it. And if anything starts to go wrong with it, like we start to notice that it's imperfect <laughs> or temporary uh, or incomplete, the mind simply jumps to the next one and grabs it, just like a monkey swinging through the trees. It goes from one to another to another to another so fast that unless we make a special effort to observe it, we would never even see it, never even notice it. So this is the mental life of most people. Simply jumping from thought to thought, the psychologists call this association, that something will come up in the environment, it'll remind us of something else that happened in the past. And this is, by the way, another meaning of the word chittam. Chittam also means memory. And so the mind will recall this memory and then go through a whole number on it. You know, oh, this was me and that happened and I felt this way. And oh, it could have been so much better if only such and such would happen and blah, 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 blah. And the aim is always to enjoy, to own, control and enjoy and uh, to a lesser degree, to become, to identify. So in this way, the, the mental life is going on like a machine, basically. And the senses are driving it, but this process of name and form and consciousness forming a vortex, rapidly spinning vortex, like the eddies that come up in the wake of a boat or around a stone in a rapidly flowing stream. 
And it's actually the same phenomenon. It's just that the, the medium, instead of water, is thought. So we are constantly confronted by this. And unless we make a special effort to let go of it, then it just goes on automatically. But as long as it goes on, we cannot be aware of the self with a capital S because it's screened off. So this is the effort. This is the process of yoga with all of its different steps and techniques and so on, are simply to, first of all, get rid of the idea that I am the body. And I guess you could summarize the second step as getting the, rid of the idea that I am the mind. And what's left? Pure consciousness. I Actually, am. awareness. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that awareness is predicated on being, unconditioned being, and that's the I am. So, at this point, all effort ceases, and one simply rests in the heart cave in this state of perfection, of grace. And so this is the actual process of who am I? It's a little bit more involved, <laughs> to put it mildly, than what is popularly understood, or I should say misunderstood, as being the Ramana's process. Uh, when he would refer to it in conversations and like that, in a, just a passing way, without explaining all the details, people would take it in a very simplistic way. That you just look inside and say, well, who am I? And even today, there are teachers using this phrase in this kind of colloquial or uh, simplified way. And they are, they are uh, branding it as Ramana's teaching. But it's not. It's incomplete because it doesn't have all the parts. The preliminaries are actually required. And without that, you don't have the same thing. In fact, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> and one simply remains identified with the body and mind to some degree. So my experience over the last few days um, and especially last night, I mean, I got a, f a few hours of sleep and then I woke up about midnight. And so I started to do this practice. And it was just so wonderful. There's no way I can explain it. But it basically kept me up all night. <laughs> but I found in the morning, even though I had only gotten four or five hours sleep, I wasn't tired. And I went on to do a whole full day of my usual activities. So this is the refreshing aspect of samadhi. Samadhi is sometimes likened to sleep because in samadhi, the mind rests. But it's not exactly sleep because one is aware even though the mind has stopped, the consciousness has not. And it's not covered over by ignorance like it is in deep sleep. So this nirvikalpa samadhi, no thoughts, no desires, no identification. Uh, this is such a refreshing thing. It's like a tonic, you know? You come out of it feeling so purified and like, ready to engage with life <clears throat> because now you haven't exhausted yourself in dreams uh, during the night and uh, the mind is fresh, clean and aware. So what can I say? You know, it's like once you see something, you can't unsee it. Yes. Once you reach a platform or a stage of the practice, where it really starts to work for you, you can never go back. 
Yeah, so I can say this is going to be the new normal. Uh, this is going to be now the, the platform of practice that I aspire to in my everyday life. Yes, sir. May I say a couple of things about the uh, inquiry and the practice of inquiry? Uh, the first is with the body. Uh, I, I spent a year once uh, trying to see if I'm the body or not. And uh, one of the things that was helpful for me is uh, awareness. If you notice the body, you would notice that the body is insentient. The body is not aware. And there's something that is providing the awareness of the body. It's not the body that is providing its own awareness. I know the body. The body doesn't know me. Who am I? Very interesting. Very good insight. So uh, that is a powerful uh, place to look at the body. So we have several ways. The body changes. I don't change. Uh, and the body is known. Who is the knower? The other thing I just wanted to talk about, the second step uh, with the mind, Ramana also equates ego with the mind. So quieting the mind is at the same time shutting up the ego. And that this quieting the mind, it, like uh, Swamiji was saying, that I think is almost the entire purpose of yoga is to get the mind out of the way. And when the mind is out of the way, the ego has no place to stand. And so what ego? Well, simply recognizing that the I thought is a fabrication goes a long way to accomplishing that. Yes, yes. The I thought is the root of the mind, and so many branches and leaves are coming from that root. So if the root is dug up or cut or removed, then the branches <coughs> and leaves automatically will dry up. Again, once that is accomplished, there's no more effort required. So how are we doing? Are there any questions? I, I had no questions, but I just want to comment. I didn't know how to uh, an, analyze who am I. So when I went through uh, this teaching, then I realized that we have to make use of the kosha system to look at ourselves. The Alamaya kosha, the... Uh, yes. So I said, oh yeah, so when we be so sick from the Alamaya kosha, then we go to the Pranema kosha, then the next day, Manamaya Kosha. So that is the aspect of the the, uh, the mind. And that aspect of the mind goes into consciousness. Am I right? Because I did not know how to, how is it I'm not the body I was thinking all the time? Because I wouldn't really feel my body. <laughs> yes, Ramana <laughs> says in one of the talks, in the talks book, that the process of neti neti, not this, not this, refers to the five koshas. Like, I can't be the food body because the food body is born and dies. I can't be the prana my kosha because it changes. And the same with the manu kosha, the mind. 
and the Vijnana Maya Kosha, desire is constantly changing. The only thing that's permanent or reliable is the Ananda Maya Kosha or consciousness. No, this kind often. of analysis, oh sorry, through, through this analysis, I understand, I was just thinking, I only feel myself as the body, so I'm learning from, from this when you go through the koshas, that's how I relate to it. That's well, good. who is feeling the body? Yes. I, that's that's what you were going to say, right, Richard? Uh, actually, I was going to uh, go through it the long way rather than the short way. Often when I right uh, lead a uh, inquiry, uh, I will go through the koshas and I will go through it basically like this. Uh, am I the body? You know, which part of the body could I be? Am I my shoulder? <laughs> I can feel my shoulder. I know my shoulder. Uh, my shoulder doesn't know me, etc. Then what I've found, it's useful to go through the senses while you're talking the body. Am I my senses? Am I my eyes? Am I vision? I know the vision. I can't be it, etc. And uh, get through the senses because that is also part of our fascination with the body is the senses are how we know it. Then uh, again, am I the life energy flowing through my body, the prana? Uh, I feel that energy. I know that energy. The energy doesn't know me. How could I be it? Am I my mind? Am I my thoughts? Which thought am I? Am I a collection of thoughts? Uh, you know, what's going on here? Am I the intellect, the thing that makes sense and order out of the thought and then projects that order into my experience of this so-called world? Am I this? I know that. That has no power without me knowing it and believing it and acting on it, how can that be me? And then beneath all of those is this quiet peace of the Anandamaya Kosha. But even that, I know that. So I'm something deeper even than my deepest, most peaceful experience it. If I experience it, then that means I know it. I'm not it. Who am I? So I, that's a little longer version of uh, dealing with the koshas. Here, what I oh, sorry. What I understand, looking at the Anamaya kosha, because a lot of us uh, have a lot of food attachments. So we thought that when we have food attachments, we feed the body, so we feel good. But we never thought about the other, uh, the non-physical bodies. So it's from the non-physical bodies, from the pranamaya kosha, that you can work your detachment from food. Because we have a practice called Nirahara Samyanma, to here we only drink liquids. So uh, once you, because the Hara, the Hara center, so once you get used to it, you say, oh, I'm not the body, but I'm actually working on the Pranamaya Kosha to go into the next level. So when I listen to this, so yeah, that's how I can relate. Because when I get teachings, it's a big soul puzzle. I pick one here, pick one there, but I could not join. So when I come for this also, oh yeah, now I understand. Good. Yeah, this process is a very high level yogic process. And there are so many stages within each stage where you go step by step. And that was a very nice observation that you made that the disidentification with the lower stages, the, lo the sheaths, is accomplished by situating yourself in the higher ones. 
This is why knowledge and intelligence are very much praised and why consciousness is the highest value in the yoga system. But even consciousness has to be transcended at the end because consciousness is dual. There's a uh, subject and an object. But when the subject and object become one, there's no more duality. And this is the non-dual state. And it's indescribable. It leads to this Avaita state that we have to experience because I was thinking, how I never, I could never relate. So once when I listen, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How I relate to the koshas. That's what I was relating. And I said, well, how I, I look at the whole thing. It's interesting. When you were talking about this, you were holding your hand in front of your face like a mirror. It's like you're trying to see yourself and using the koshas as a mirror. And that is valid up to a certain point because the koshas get their animation and their energy from the self. Described in the Drishya Vivekaha, that the self radiates consciousness, which is reflected in the body and the mind and the lower koshas. So not that they are alive or animate or conscious in the selves, but they simply reflect the consciousness of the self. Like the moon being reflected in many small puddles is the example given. It's the same moon and it even looks the same, but the difference between the original and the reflection is that one is permanent and the other is not. Is Nick still with us? Yo, Nick. <laughs> hey, what's up, Swami? <laughs> How are you? There you are. All good. Fine. Very good. And you? I'm doing fine. Um, I just want to share a thought. I don't have um, any particular questions or anything. But um, ever since getting into this teaching, um, I've been... Uh, I guess more suited to distinguish the I from myself and, you know, what they mean in relation to each other and everything else. And um, as I noticed that the less I identify with this I, uh, you know, the more at peace I am, you know, I guess that goes with the, um, the unidentification of, you know, with the body. And what I noticed is, you know, the self is unlimited, you know, I can be here, there, because it's just pretty much what I'm made of. And once I'm the happiest that I am, you know, when meditation, whatever the case may be, you know, that's when I get the most creative and the most ideas. So I noticed that uh, the ontology, I guess you would say, there's nothing like it when it comes to the self, if that makes sense. What's inside me can be the only, um, I guess, facilitation of happiness. And I haven't understood that on the, on the level. And so, you know, reading about, I mean, watching you guys actually, and the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. And I thought that was pretty interesting that I understood down that level. I'll give another example. Uh, Everything is, I guess, only satisfactory to myself, or I deem it that way because I put myself into it, at the I. Like, say, for example, friends, family, uh, hobbies, whatever the case may be, that has the I in it. And that's the, the identification, what, I guess, suits me. That's, that's why I make it, 
what, what would I say? I guess deemable to, to my liking was when I add that I into it. So I noticed that throughout the day when I inquired, the, like the who am I, um, when, when, I, when, I throw the, uh, when I bring it back to myself, the, the I, who am I, and I identify with my, my inner being, my inner uh, satisfactoriness, I'm always happier. Even when I think about uh, more material things, like I guess an example would be money, being rich, whatever the case. Once I bring that I to myself, and I know there's nothing like that in the world besides I, whatever that may be, I don't even know yet. It's, it's just so much better. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thought I had. Good thought. Now, uh, you feel when the, your small eye gets out of the way, you feel happiness mm-hmm. because that's who you are. Yes. And there's and, nothing like it in the world. Yes. And the other thing is that the more you look, the more you know mm-hmm. it is always there. And one way, in fact, to find it is just notice mm-hmm. this moment right now. What is it within you that is always there? Exactly. And uh, it's convenient because since it's always there, it's always there. Mm-hmm. It never goes away. That's why I'm always happy. <laughs> That's right. With that awareness. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've also been getting really hip to, uh, I guess you said, Swamiji, the negative language of the Buddha. I find that really helpful when I inquire, like when I uh, put myself in that mindset. Because I've been studying, you know, uh, Vedanta, uh, all types of traditions, you know, Shivites, Vaishnava, you know, Mother, all that stuff. But I really like it when uh, this self or this soul, spirit being, whatever the case, is really inquired with uh, negative language, like emptiness. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, language like that, I find it a little bit, uh, it, bring, it brings me to myself more than a lot of talk like, like Brahman and, and personalism mm-hmm. and all. I like mm-hmm. to simplify it with that and, you know, meditate on that from that approach. Um, I'm not sure why I think it works better for me, but I really like that approach a lot more. There are different angles of view. They're all looking at the same thing, but we relate uh, better to one angle of view at one time in our life. This may change. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because it's still this angle of view is related to mental stuff, and the Mm -hmm. mental stuff changes. Oh, well. (laughs) I just wanted to say something about the existentialists. Uh, The existentialists define the human condition as a struggle between one's internal values, the spontaneous self-nature, and the values of the external society that seeks to impose them on the individual. And so it's very handy then to use the negative concepts. Neti, neti. Mm -hmm. This is not it. This is not it. This is not it. And that makes it very easy to reject these external requirements and stimuli. And then what's left is you. However you view yourself at whatever stage of the process. process of elimination, I guess you could call it. Yeah. And until finally there's something something you can't eliminate. What Philip, I, Philip K. Dick said, reality is what's left after you stop believing in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the negative language a lot. Like you mentioned, uh, it's, it's imposing on society. That, that's, a, that's a good point. I like that a lot. It just gets to the nitty gritty of it, like, you know, the core. Mm-hmm. 
Well, what is the core? It's that everybody wants to be happy. Right? And so many things get in the way of that. And ultimately, it's our, our own doing <laughs> because we have all these desires and we're constantly juggling and trying to attain these different desires. And we want to be happy then, all the time. We want happy that's permanent. And none of these desires lead us to anything that's permanent. That's true. Because it's not out there in the world. The happiness is within us. Just like Nick was talking about. Yeah. And an important part of that is to recognize this is what makes me happy. You know, I, I'll tell you a story from my own childhood that when I was in high school, I was a, a physics prodigy and also a musical prodigy. And, you know, I tested out uh, in those days, the SATs were really important. Well, I got straight 800s in the SATs except for history, I think. Um, history was never a big interest of mine, <laughs> but all the scientific and English and conceptual stuff, I totally aced it. So I was offered a scholarship to MIT in nuclear physics. And everybody was going, take it, take it, man, go to MIT, become a, a nuclear physicist. And I started thinking about, well, what does a nuclear physicist do? It designs bombs. Do I really want to do that? No. Heck no. <laughs> no, I, don't, I would never be able to live with that on my conscience. So the other scholarship I got was for music, to go to conservatory. So I took that one. Everybody told me I was crazy. I mean, everybody. But I knew in my heart that was the right thing to do because it made me happy. Not in terms of the values of the world or society or what other people thought was right. Huh? But what I loved was beautiful music, and I wanted to make a contribution of beauty to the world, not more weapons, not destruction and, you know, all that stuff, the politics that goes along with it. You know, Einstein, he was my great hero. <laughs> Einstein one time said, I wish I had been a butcher or a plumber because this nuclear physics stuff has got so much politics and so much nonsense associated with it. So I really took that to heart. You know, he was, here he's the most brilliant physicist of our time. And he's saying, oh boy, I sure regret this, you know. Yeah. But it's very interesting that Einstein brought the observer into the whole picture. Up until that time, physics in particular, and science in general, was trying to attain an objective view. In other words, from an unspecified viewpoint. And uh, Newtonian physics especially divides space up into like a framework, like a, a grid. And whatever is true is true in every square of that grid out to infinity. Einstein said, no, that's not, that's not it. No. The observer is an integral part of the process. Without the observer, without a point of view, you can't calculate anything. And of course, he's been proved right again and again and again. But look what he did. He brought consciousness into it. There has to be a conscious entity, an observer, 
not just a machine, or even if you use a machine to take measurements and stuff, there's still somebody interpreting the results. And when they do, they're going to see that everything is relative to your point of view. Everything is measured in terms of or from the position of the observer. All motion is relative. That's the essence of relativity. So Einstein, in a sneaky way, reintroduced ob uh, subjectivity into physics in the form of the observer. And that the observer, without the observer, you don't have physics. And uh, the, the, in Newtonian physics, in the... Uh, other branches of physics based on it. The observer is still there, but is just assumed to be in local space time. Whereas in relativity, the observer can be anywhere, even like millions of light years away. And so all of our tests in astronomy using distant galaxies and quasars and stuff like this, have all borne this out. That you can actually have something moving faster than the speed of light away from you. And if that's the case, you'll never see it. That's what's called now the light cone, the universal light cone. So if there's anything beyond that, we'll never know. We can only see what is what uh, the things whose light can reach us, the observer. So I, I love that Einstein did that, you know, and they, and and was proved right. <laughs> That's the best thing. So how did we get on that one? Oh yeah, the conflict between the individual and society. See, the society was saying, no, no, it's all mechanics. Newtonian physics, right? Einstein was saying, that's wrong. It doesn't work that way. Everything is relative. And he was right. So in the same way, in, in our space, in our own little private universe, the self is the observer, the seer, drik. And the universe, the, the world, and phenomena is the scene, drishya. And then there's the act of seeing, drishti. And these three make up the ontological triple that is the essence of all existences. Without all three, you don't have an existence. So, in other words, the existentialists were right. There's always a conflict between the individual and the environment. And the resolution to that conflict is what is seen by the observer, the seeing, the drishti. Because without a live observer, without a conscious observer, there is no seeing. So the universe is not mechanical. And even though there have been many attempts to create a mechanical, more or less mechanical system of values in society, money is a good example, politics and stuff like that. Still, when it comes right down to it, the individual is the sine qua non of existence. Without the individual, there is nothing. It is the individual, the seer, that brings existence even to the world. So this is another proof of the theory of Advaita. But then as we look within at the individual, or what we think is the individual, we find that there is just this awareness that doesn't have any limits at all. So True. the individual turns out to be just this unbounded awareness. 
It's confusing yeah, I, for I was, a little mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was talking on a lower level of, of the process <laughs> where the yes. individual observer is still yes. a thing, you know. Yes, yes. But, but you're that, right. At, at the highest level, there is only the observer. And that's what we all are uh, directing ourselves towards by even being in this Zoom session today. Yeah, I, I, my life now revolves around my practice. Yes, yes, of course. You know, well, it has for a long time, but more directly more so and more yes. so yeah yes. more directly so because now this atma vichara is not a theory anymore perfect now that i've experienced it for myself and all the stages of it and been able to go into it and take it apart and put it back together again you know me i like to tinker with stuff <laughs> <laughs> tinker with being okay well, why not? That's right. Get your being adjustment wrench out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yoga is, right? Right. What's under the hood? How can it be optimally uh, calibrated for but, the highest quality of existence? But, uh, you know, what you're doing is the kind of things that we all have to do, this process of inquiry, this process of, uh, I, I don't really know what to call it, self-discovery is a kind of name it has, I think that's too small a name, but it is an individual thing, it's something that has to happen within this, uh, you know, ego, mind, body thing, because that's where the problem is, is the ideas that we hold to be real, and that is a in real individual process, and the practice is still something that you had to find within yourself, that I had to find within myself, that Nick and Kim also are finding within themselves, and... You know, so I just want to like to keep pointing back to practice and practice isn't something that is set for some limited time and space in your day, because since you exist all the time, then uh, you can practice all the time and all you have to do to practice all the time is just notice this existence that is always there. I was practicing in the dentist's office today. Yes, yes. That's how, that's how uh, Nomi was enlightened, was waiting for the dentist. <laughs> it makes you concentrate, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's right. And my dentist used to laugh at me when I said uh, the way I deal with my dentist appointment is by meditating. That makes it a lot easier when you're drilling into my head. <laughs> really? <laughs> and he thought it was funny. But, you know, I really liked what you said in the beginning, that you spent a year trying to figure out if you're the body or not. Yes. It's not something you can do in an afternoon. Yes. and To and really they, do it right. Yes. At the end of it, then I talked to Nomi about it and spoke about making some headway, and he said, then once you have learned with your body how to discriminate your own reality, then you can go ahead and apply it to the rest of the koshas, Kim. Once you see, uh. you know, you understand the process then, and it turns out the further steps are easier because you know how to do it. Just applying it on a subtler and subtler yes, level. Yes, yes, the same process works. Well, I really like the conclusions that we've come to in this meeting. I really think, you know, this conversation is getting someplace. 
the dialogue, which is what we wanted when we started this, right, Richard? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we want it to be a conversation, not just a lecture. I get so tired of lecturing. <laughs> Come on, can we hear from Kim or Nick again? I'm tired of us old men voices. <laughs> Hey, Richard, what'd you say? <laughs> and again, uh, Kim and Nick, uh, treat this last eight minutes of the thing today is uh, you're never going to have another chance in your life to ask the questions you have that are the deepest questions. And this is your chance, and uh, we're just waiting. What is the um, meditation process? How should we go about it? I think that's what we've been talking about the whole time, right? No? Yeah, but then specifically, how? Firstly, we question who am I? Why am I here for? I do ask myself. Well, personally, I like to meditate lying down. Then I can just forget about my body. You know, I put something over my eyes if there's any light. So there's no distractions. I'll even put earplugs sometimes. So I can just completely forget about the body. And I look at the mind. And uh, what is the mind identified with now? If there's no body, there's no desires. If there's no desires, there's no doing, no having. So there's only thinking. Well, what am I thinking about? Usually it's nonsense. <laughs> so I negate that, I nullify it, let it fade away. And then the only thought that's left is I. So when that fades away, then the most beautiful light opens up and this is something it a certain kind of light that has a special quality to it uh, a friend of mine once called it sparkly <laughs> kind of sparkly uh, i don't know why that is but you know how in the beginning of meditation when you first get concentration Sometimes you'll see a little sparkle, like a star. I have another friend who actually calls them stars. One time he asked me, are you seeing stars? I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and that, that is when the covering of the self is penetrated just for a moment. And the light comes out, you know, like a flash. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's red. And these are signs that good concentration is reached. And then it's just a matter of time. You stick with it for long enough. Eventually, you will outlast the mind. <laughs> no, it's true. The mind has a... Uh, specific uh, duration or uh, endurance and the will is stronger if you simply persist even though the mind is jumping here and there like a monkey you know how it does you just persist keep patiently moving it back you know bring it back onto the self and eventually the mind just sort of gives up. And I said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, Kim, I, uh, 
at a much simpler level than Swamiji, uh, I meditate sitting up. I find a place that is comfortable for my body, and I just park it there. And uh, I still often, I like to use questions as a springboard, because to ask a question means I don't know, and it gives me an openness. And I use different questions besides who am I. I there are a lot of questions that you can ask that lead the same way. One of my favorite ones is who is inquiring? You know, is the inquiry for the mind or is the inquiry for something deeper than the mind? And, you know, so it's a, a point for diving in is kind of how hmm. I think of it. And then, like Nick, I just get happy. I can't help it. <laughs> I wanted to ask, doesn't the uh, Who Am I inquiry get a little old? What are some other things we could inquire about specifically? Could it be anything long as it yes. has to do with? As long as you're pointing uh, within, and I think that's a good point. For me, uh, you can't do it where it's a habit, because if it's a habit, it's just uh, your mind knows what to do, and you get into some level of mental programming. So uh, I ask in a lot of different ways, and uh, all of them work as long as they... Uh, point to something that is deeper than the mind. You know, who knows the mind is one. Uh, there are many of them along the way of who knows. There are also many of them along the line of what actually exists. And so mm -hmm. if you look at uh, who am I, I... Uh, instruct people to start their meditation with noticing that they exist. You exist, you know that you exist, and if you look at how you know you exist, it's not through your mind, it's not through your senses, you just know. So already you've started the inquiry deeper than the mind or the senses, and it's easy if you start with, I exist, then you can explore easily either the I, what is this I anyway? I know it's there. Or you can explore the exist part. What exists? I know I exist, but what exists? I mean, it's, is it this finger that exists? You know, where is it? What is it? Who is it? I know it's there. That's a very good point because the self is uh, technically uncreated, right? I've always been conscious my whole life. So that, that's a really good point. That actually made me think that, that, you know, I technically didn't ask for this body. I've just always been conscious, like even sleeping, deep sleep, like the self is always there. And yes. like, like you mentioned, uh, like how you inquire in terms of like what's thinking this thought behind this thought, you know, what's, what's the awareness of that? And yeah, I should inquire more like in, in that way. And again, not inquiry is not a habit. You have to, it has to somehow be this live experience. Mm -hmm. I like the spirit of, of relentlessness in your questioning, Richard. Well, I want to get to the bottom of it. Shit, I don't know. <laughs> ah, that's the mood. I want to let me get to the bottom of this. I'm going to figure this out. Right. So that I got it cold. Right. That's what Ramana did in his 20 minutes. He said, I'm going to solve this right now. And he did. You know, the Buddha did something very similar when he sat down under the Bodhi tree. Yes. That fateful night. Yes. 
He said, I am not getting up until I figure it out. Yes. Mm. Well, I have to be everything, right? Because the moon sets, uh, this, I mean, I'm sorry, the sun sets, the moon rises, and vice versa. All these things in life pretty much have the similar, I guess, dictation of, you know, facility. If, if that's not right, like, uh, every species on this planet has genitals, for example. We're similar in that way. We're similar with, like, the coming and going of the seasons. I don't know. I'm starting to feel like I'm everything in a sense. Maybe that's the wrong idea. You're no, everything. It's, it's perfect. perfect. Different level. Yeah, you are everything. What was that I told you one time, Richard? I had re- this. I looked out the window and saw like the whole valley of Arnachula. And I said, I am all of this. Yes. That was about, what, four years ago? Yes. Mm. And you still are. Yeah, it hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> uh, wow, what a great conversation. Yes, anyway, and we Thank also you. are uh, have run past our regular time limit. And I don't know what we, why we want to limit what is limitless, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to thank uh, Swami G and uh, Nick and Kim for joining us today. Uh, it's a special time that we have together, and without you here, uh, it's not our time together. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om. <laughs> and Namaste. Namaste, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you. So much. Thank you, Richard. Okay. I'll come every week to discuss. It's good. Mm-hmm. Good. You good. See,